Hey everyone, welcome to this next episode in my series covering Dune, my reaction and analysis for the book. I am excited to get into chapter three. If you haven't yet already, go ahead and take a look at the introduction video that I made for the series we're covering for Dune, as well as chapter one and chapter two reaction and analysis. Today we are covering chapter three, and I'm excited to get into it. Just as a reminder, I am doing this series to cover my thoughts on writing, um, as well as enjoying the book itself. But the main intention of this series is so that you can understand where I'm coming from as a writer, and I want you to be able to enjoy my writings when I publish my own books. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you're going through this so you can see uh, what my thoughts are on, um, on my own writing and what I intend to do uh, with, with what I create. So with that introduction out of the way, let's get into chapter three. Thus spoke St. Alia of the Knife. The Reverend Mother must combine the seductive wiles of a courtesan with the untouchable majesty of a virgin goddess, holding these attributes in tension so long as the powers of her youth endure. For when youth and beauty have gone, she will find that the place between, once occupied by tension, has become a wellspring of cunning and resourcefulness. From Uadib Family Commentaries by the Princess Arulan. This uh, excerpt is is different because it doesn't focus on Paul or Atreides. It focuses on the Reverend Mother. So I'm interested to see what this chapter has to bring to the table. And in it is some sort of kind of hidden wisdom almost that, as they say, as, as you age, beauty kind of fades and what's left is what who you actually are. So I wouldn't say there's anything super original here, but I do like that it's referring to the Reverend Mother needing that type of awareness of herself and through the years kind of build up some sort of legacy of who she is um, to kind of to continue that capture of people around her in her life. So uh, really interesting and, uh, and I enjoyed enjoyed the excerpt here. I kind of wanted to finish this beginning part of the dialogue between uh, Jessica and the Reverend Mother, but uh, I came across one bit of it that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, the Reverend Mother uh, said to Jessica that she thought she could produce the Quizwatch Heterac um, by having a son instead of a daughter. And Jessica says, Jessica lifted her chin, I sensed the possibility. So I wonder if her sensing the possibility has something to do with um, the genetic line that the Ben Jesuit is trying to maintain or make stronger to produce this um, this heterac. Um, so I, I wonder if either they're getting so close and Lady Jessica could could kind of feel that within her, or if it has to do with just herself personally, if she knew that she had a son, that he, he specifically had the potential to do that. Just an interesting um, phrase there. I wonder how much meaning is is behind that. Okay, we're already getting into the multiple layers of this story. You have the Harkonnens in the last chapter looking to basically obliterate um, House Atreides and to be known for it and to secure that power, um, owning their own fief on um, Arrakis. And now we see that the Ben Jesuit's plan was to have Lady Jessica have a daughter so that um, she could be wed to a um, Harkonnen. Um, so just two totally different goals there. Um, so I can see why the Reverend Mother would be upset that Jessica had a son and not a daughter. That probably, they probably meticulously um, really try to create these bloodlines and, and, and breeding in, into, different, um, into different houses and trying to maintain that to build up to what they want. So this probably really throws a wrench in it. And I wonder, I'm pretty sure it's said or... Um, I remember that the Reverend Mother kind of serves the Emperor, or rather not serves him, but um, acts alongside him in a way. So I wonder if she knows the plan of the Harkonnens. Just a lot of interesting stuff already happening so early on. I'm enjoying this dialogue between uh, Jessica and the Reverend Mother. I think so far it's my favorite piece of in interaction. I know we're still early in the book um this this one portion between them um jessica states um that she'll shield um that she'll shield paul as, as best as she can and the reverend mother says shield uh you well you well know the weakness there shield your son too much jessica and he'll not grow enough to fulfill any destiny so it sounds like that even though the reverend mother 
is upset that the bloodline has been tainted or, or not exactly how they want to come out, that she still sees something in Paul as well. And whether she thinks that he could be the Hatterach, I think she, the Reverend Mother probably thinks that a little bit. Maybe there's something else that Paul can serve as well. Um, to go along with what I said about the, the dialogue exchange between them so far, uh, Herbert definitely progresses the story through um, character uh, dialogue and choices and expression. And he does an excellent job at it. So I think uh, in the first video and the first chapter, I said it got into it really quickly. That's just Herbert's style. And I'm enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. Um, it just comes across very natural, the characters interacting together and, and telling the story and what's happening. So uh, um, definitely a, a great job there. Okay, so uh, again, reacting as I go along. Uh, so the Reverend Mother does tell uh, Jessica that there's little chance of your lad becoming the Ben Jezra totality. I assume that's a, the, the Hadrach as well. Uh, you mustn't let yourself hope too much. So I guess that's kind of uh, the Reverend Mother's thoughts on it, unless she is hiding something from Jessica, which I don't get that here. This is a very good quote, I think, by the Reverend Mother. Another um, reason why I think this book kind of has an epic feeling, I'm thinking about quotes from, from Tolkien's works. Uh, she said, it should be one of the tests. Um, humans are almost always lonely. Just kind of interesting. Um, obviously, that statement, if you look at it factually, is untrue. There are times where humans do not feel lonely. And I know it's referencing a little bit something in the book, but I think at at times we all feel alone, whether it's in our suffering or in our goals or our passions and um, throughout life at some point. So I like it when fiction reveals truth. Um, that's what makes fiction real in a sense. So um, good quote there that, that I enjoyed. Okay, I just wanted to finish reading to the end of the chapter because it's just so good I don't want to stop it's it's one continuous uh, flow in each chapter but a couple thoughts here as, as I'm reading um, just the Reverend Mother asking Paul about his dream the detail that he goes into it um, it's just a, it's enjoyable introduction and kind of the world building and discovery process that Paul's going to get into on his journey Also, I really like Paul's, I guess you could say wisdom or insight, but I believe it is a part of his genetics and um, him becoming the, the heteric. Um, the, the, the Reverend Mother says, um, I can help you with a few hints at why they failed, referring to other males who have kind of tried to fill that role. And Paul um, thinks to himself, she talks and hints, she doesn't really know anything. Um, just a interesting insight there. And I like that um, Frank Herbert doesn't make him some, at least at this point, some all-powerful, being able to pinpoint exactly what people are saying right off the back. I think that'd be a little bit too powerful. He kind of start, starts off in this medium ground where Paul has this sense of suspicion and truth, and I think it's really intriguing, and I am really enjoying Paul's character so far. So I am getting the sense that the Reverend Mother does know about the Harkonnens, um, taking House Atreides, which is weird because it sounds like that she kind of wants Paul to stay alive. So the specifics of the plan, I'm not quite worked out on what's going on in the Reverend Mother's mind. But uh, she does say here, essentially she is f foregoing or um, insinuating that uh, Paul's father is, is worth nothing, almost in a way that he will be no more. And Paul gets kind of angry at that because he isn't aware of the plan and what will happen. So it seems like that the Reverend Mother has her own plans involved within the Harkonnen uh, plot to take down House Atreides. So um, again, just more layering to see. Everyone has all these different plans and expectations, and it's interesting. I mean, it's it's weaving a really good web so far. This is the strongest chapter yet, I think, on this last dialogue between the Reverend Mother and then also the final sentence in the chapter. I'll just go ahead and, and read that. Um, so the Reverend Mother says, uh, Goodbye, young human. I hope you make it. But if you don't, well, we shall yet succeed. Um, just kind of saying that she definitely has the long-term goal in mind for the Ben Gesserit. And while she sees potential in Paul, and I guess some of her plan involves Paul stepping into this role that they want him to. 
she realizes that even if he fails, they have, I'm sure that they have backup and different genetic lines trying to do different things. So it seems like she's comforted in the fact that even in her mind, it, it almost seems like this is a small portion or a uh, small instance of a potential in the grand scheme of things. Whereas as the reader, we're looking at it as this is the story. Um, so interesting mindset from the Reverend Mother. And then the last paragraph as the Reverend Mother walks away. Uh, but Jessica had caught one glimpse of the Reverend Mother's face as she turned away. There had been tears on the seamed cheeks. The tears were more unnerving than any other word or sign that had passed between them this day. Um, man, so many questions after that paragraph, especially with the setting up of the Ben Jesuit's goals for Paul and um, just as a whole in chapter two, the revelation of the Harkonnens looking to throw House Atreides and then the Reverend Mother apparently crying at the end. She doesn't seem like a, um, I'll say a human who has much like emotion or feeling towards others. So I wonder I don't know. I'll have to see exactly how this all plays out. Um, But I'm this, it just, every chapter reveals something new, something bigger and an extra layer to the story. And I'm really excited to dig into chapter four. Well, there you have it. The end of chapter three. I am really enjoying uh, Dune so far, much more than the first time now that I'm taking my time and really going through a deep analysis of it while I go through it and keeping all the parts and, and moving characters and dialogue exchanges in my mind. So I'm really enjoying it. I hope you are. And next time we'll get into chapter four. If you haven't, please like this video, subscribe if you want to follow the content or support me. And if you have any thoughts on what I discussed today, uh, leave a comment below. You can also go to my website, fill out a contact form, and we can have a dialogue about whatever you want to talk about. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.